In 1985, a group of seven people, most of them engineers and all of them formerly of the tech company Linkabit, formed a company called Qualcomm, short for Quality Communications. Today, a few decades later, Qualcomm is valued at almost $70 billion. But the path it's taken to get there is not without controversy. They charge exorbitant prices. The FTC is really going after Qualcomm's bread and butter. When I saw Qualcomm doing it, first I thought, that's never going to work. The optics of it don't look particularly good. So what does Qualcomm actually do? because it's not exactly a household name. Qualcomm, they uh, do something with uh, phones. I think I've seen the name, but I have no idea what they're doing. No, I've never heard of Qualcomm. Some sort of tech company. Apple and Qualcomm have some kind of, uh, there's like maybe some kind of patent infringement. I think I have heard the name before, but beyond that, I couldn't tell you any more at all. And I haven't heard the name Qualcomm before. Qualcomm is the company that has been, over the years, developing a lot of the fundamental technologies that make cell phones work. And we license that technology to a horizontal model that any company can come in. The other part of the business is our semiconductor business. And we produce chips for phones and for everything that the mobile industry has been transforming. You should assume that the absolute majority of the phones uh, today has a Qualcomm processor on it. So fundamentally, Qualcomm invents and licenses technologies and designs semiconductor chips. And as a result, it has a massive amount of patents, over 130,000 if you include patent applications. And today, licensing those patents accounts for more than half of its operating income. R&D has been a big focus of the company since the beginning. Qualcomm's first big win was pioneering a new wireless technology in the late 80s called CDMA1, which in 1995 became one of two industry standards for the way cell phone networks work. Along with the competing GSM technology, it defined the 2G era of cell phones. This, along with its growing portfolio of telecommunications patents, was what initially secured Qualcomm's position in the industry. They really held uh, a monopolistic position in 3G and 4G. Uh, they had the patents, they were the first, they were the best. Every phone you will see in the US, you know, a few years ago, had Qualcomm modems in them. In every single generation of wireless, Qualcomm had contributed the fundamental technology that actually made that possible. When it comes to chips, it's important to note that Qualcomm is a fabless microchip company, which means it designs them but contracts out their actual production. And it's most well known for a line of processors it calls Snapdragon. So what we do is we build the core processor that sits inside the cell phone. Qualcomm's really known for something called an SOC, which is a system on a chip. That's really a computer on a chip. So you can think of the system on a chip kind of like the, the human brain. The system on a chip in a phone is very similar. So you have a lot of uh, disparate functions, but they all work together cohesively with system software, and that's what the system on a chip does. If you look at the communications portion of the chip itself, let's say back in 2012, it was 100 megabits per second. Five years later, it was a gigabit per second. So more than a tenfold increase over five years. And now as we move to the 5G generation, we're looking at another uh, 10x improvement in speed that the uh, device and Snapdragon can offer. And right now, 5G is a huge deal to Qualcomm. We started investing in 5G technology over 10 years ago, waiting for this moment that would come in 2019. And now we're right on the cusp of that happening. But what does 5G actually mean? If you go back in time and you looked at 2G, what did 2G bring? It bring uh, digital voice, right? So your call was more clear. Then 3G and 4G emerged, and that was about more than voice. It was about connecting to the internet. But 5G will expand much beyond that. 5G will enable machines to talk to machines with high reliability. For example, an automobile, right? Automobiles, autonomous driving is emerging. So you want a very reliable, high-speed communication between automobiles, that's possible with 5G. A lot of the connectivity features, the 4G and the 5G technology and the telematics modules that allow us to have Wi-Fi hotspots in the car and leveraging content from the outside, or even a lot of the cellular via to X technology of getting time to green and, and, and light information, as well as safety features directly from other cars, you're gonna to start to see that in technology very soon in, in the coming years. In the beginning, it's going to be very mobile broadband centric. That means we're going to have smartphones 
which are going to have we can experience much higher data rates and much lower latencies and that is going to change the way we do uh, uh, our own uh, uh, businesses so 5g is not just a marketing term it's an actual set of new standards ultimately defined by the international telecommunication union that will lay out how the next generation of cell phones and other mobile devices will work but how soon we'll actually be able to buy those devices and have the systems in place to make use of their 5G tech is yet to be seen. A lot of times in the semiconductor industry, our marketing uh, outpaces our engineering. So when people say, oh, 5G's here, not so much. It'll be years in the making. 3G and 4G, Qualcomm dominated the industry. Some people say they may have behaved badly as a result. You know, they were very uh, monopolistic behavior. And that's good for Qualcomm, but it's not good for the industry. 5G is going to be much more open. Many more companies are participating in it. There's no way Qualcomm's going to have the same position that they've had in the past. Another big focus for Qualcomm right now is artificial intelligence. Qualcomm began our research on AI over a decade ago with uh, Qualcomm AI Research. And uh, in about 2015, we started integrating AI onto the chip. What that means is we put special processing capability into our chips to accelerate artificial intelligence. When you combine fast communications with 5G with incredible computational capability with AI, then you really have a platform that'll change the world. But alongside Qualcomm's history of innovation is a complex legal history. In March of 2018, the Trump administration blocked an attempted hostile Qualcomm takeover by competitor Broadcom, citing national security concerns. A few months later, Qualcomm itself failed to acquire another chip rival, NXP, when it couldn't get Chinese regulatory approval. But its most high-profile cases involve a series of antitrust lawsuits. In 2009, Qualcomm was fined $208 million by South Korea's antitrust agency, the Korea Fair Trade Commission. In 2015, it paid a $975 million fine in China after an antitrust dispute. In 2016, it was again fined by South Korea, this time for $865 million. It avoided a $778 million fine from Taiwan's Fair Trade Commission by agreeing to invest $700 million in Taiwan over the next five years. It was fined $1.2 billion by the European Union, and right now it's facing an anti-monopoly lawsuit from the FTC. The US FTC says Qualcomm maintains this monopoly over a key type of chip used in cell phones called baseband processors. And the government says it does that by using these anti-competitive tactics. For example, it says Qualcomm only supplies those chips to cell phone manufacturers um, if those manufacturers also agree to license patents from Qualcomm on its preferred terms. So the government says that forces those customers to pay these higher fees, these rates, and violates competition law. Qualcomm uh, is fighting back very hard because Qualcomm um, denies any and all wrongdoing and says at the end of the day the government just hasn't actually proven that its business practices in any way harm consumers or the overall uh, broader competitive market. When people sell chips, they just sell the chip. You know, you pay for the chip, like going to the store. Qualcomm had a business model where if you use their chip, they got a percentage of the total cost of the device. So this business model is something I've never experienced. When I saw Qualcomm doing it, first I thought, that's never going to work. But again, they had a monopoly. You had no choice. If you wanted an SOC, if you wanted a modem, if you wanted to be in the smartphone business, you had to do business with Qualcomm. The FTC is really going after Qualcomm's bread and butter, which is its patent licensing business, and that actually accounted for more than 50% of its operating income in its last reported quarter. The key point seems to be certainly the linking between selling a chip and also asking for a royalty as well as the money for that chip. Why is that something that you continue to pursue? When I buy a car, I get all the IP that comes along with that car. Why not when I buy a Qualcomm chip, don't I already get the IP that comes along with buying the chip? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is, if you look, the agreements that we have, we have two separate businesses. The licensing business is about licensing the full portfolio of Qualcomm's patents. Some of them involve the chip, uh, some of them don't involve the chip. In fact, the vast majority of them don't involve the chip. Then on the chip side, we obviously compete in a very, very competitive chip market. And I think when we look at the market, uh, there's no way to conclude that that isn't the most competitive semiconductor industry in the world. It is the who's who of people that want to work in there.
And then there's Apple. The two companies worked together for years, but have now filed multiple lawsuits against each other. We're really just trying to get somebody to pay on a contract that's been in place for 10 years. You have people who are uh, naysayers. One of the naysayers is not an analyst, it's Qualcomm. Qualcomm keeps telling me over and over again, you're going to come to the table, you have to, lost a suit in Germany, lost a suit in China, that wait till you see them cave. Are you going to cave? No. The issue that we have with Qualcomm is that they have a policy of no, no license, no chips. This is, in, in our view, illegal, and so many regulators in many different countries agree with this. And then secondly, they have an obligation to offer their patent portfolio, patent portfolio on a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory basis, and they don't do that. They charge exorbitant prices, and they have a lot of different tactics they use to do that. So the very basics of these recent legal fights are that the FTC and Apple think Qualcomm is behaving monopolistically. Apple thinks Qualcomm has infringed on its IP and vice versa. And both Apple and Qualcomm think the other owes them money. Let's say somebody who's not as familiar with the company, but sees the headlines. Well, they settled with the Chinese after a dispute. It was a billion dollars. Now the South Koreans came after them, and it was a $750 million fine. They're challenging that. The FTCs come after them. Apple's come after them. I mean, the optics of it don't look particularly good for this unique business model you, you talk about. Well, I, th I think it's probably more the result of the industry structure and how powerful some of the people that would like to attack that unique business model are versus the business model itself. And the Qualcomm model is being challenged in another way because companies are increasingly deciding to just make their own chips. Facebook's doing their own semiconductors. Google, Amazon, Tesla, you know, these people from Qualcomm are now everywhere. It doesn't take semiconductor experts to make a chip anymore. Look, there's no question the company have been through a lot, especially like in the past year. In one of the most difficult years that we had, with a number of uh, legal activities, plus a possible hostile acquisition of the company, during that year, the team here at Qualcomm accelerated 5G by one year, and some of the products we deliver, like the Snapdragon 845, has been one of the best products in our history. And I think that speaks to the resilience and the capability of the Qualcomm employees. If anything, I will say, all of the challenges that we have made us to be a much more focused company, make us really understand our core competence and make sure that we continue to do what we do best, which is to move the technology forward, you know, drive the new transition to 5G and basically expand mobile to other industries.